What's up, NBA fans? What's up, all sports fans? It's your boy, JB, host of the Behind the Bench Podcast Networking Channel. Giving a shout-out to the rest of the crew. Shy, Kelvin, Jermaine, KB Film Room, Big Dog, Talk Sports. That's right, that's right. And we thank you for tuning in and supporting the channel and help making this show the best that it can be with now over 2,200 subscribers. Wow. And, uh, hey, they definitely put a smile on our faces for sure. So we're doing something right. Now, check it out, check it out. This is what I want to talk about. I want to give kudos to an original draftee, an original draftee. I know it's a. it sounds like a, a foreign concept these days to build around your young talent, at least... <laughs> That was before we started seeing a wave of teams do just that. And in the Western Conference, they sit in the top the uh, standings, and you have the defending champion, Denver Nuggets, who built around. They drafted cornerstone player Nikola Jokic, Jamal Murray, Michael Porter Jr. And they have continued to draft in young talent, Christian Braun, uh, Peyton, uh, Washington, and the like. But kudos to one Josh Hart. I remember when he was drafted by my squad, the Los Angeles Lakers. And fan, a lot of fans of, of the franchise don't realize how revolutionary the scouting department actually was. Particularly from 2016 up until 2018, at the least. But we'll just... We'll, Technically, from 2014 to 2018, that four-year draft period, i never seen a team draft that deep before over four-year period to where you almost feel every position outside of maybe uh, the, the uh, shooting guard, the two-guard uh, spot. But Josh Hart was drafted by the uh, Lakers after playing four years of uh, college basketball at the University of Villanova and won a – national championship with his teammate of the New York Knicks now, uh, Jalen Brunson. And the Lakers were four, four ahead of the curve. They were so far ahead of the curve where, remember, it became almost looked down upon to draft players with multiple years of college experience because the thought became, rather than what it used to be, that – a player must not be good enough if they have to stay in college four years uh, to prepare for the NBA. Where actually, that was the rule rather than the exception. Well, from the time where the NBA started to draft a multitude of uh, high school players into the league, and then once they stopped that practice and implemented the one-and-done rule, well, the Lakers went, they started to reverse the pendulum back to drafting players with multiple years of college experience, a la Josh Hart, who played all four years, a la Kyle Kuzma, who played all four years. So now you're bringing in players who are more mature, maybe not as talented per se, but more mature, as the one and done players to where now your, your team is really balanced and you really could have started developing at an accelerated rate once everything got going. See, they, I mean, they had the blueprint, man, and you can see how other franchises have taken that same blueprint and they, run, they are running away with it. Look at the Oklahoma City Thunder. Look at what they're doing this year after being down for the, you know, for the previous like three, four years. Look at where they're at right now. Look at the Minnesota Timberwolves. Look at teams like that. Look at what Denver did. You know, they built around, they, they drafted Nikola Jokic. I believe they drafted him in 2015 and tw like 2015, 2016. And they stayed the course. Same thing with Milwaukee, what they did with Giannis at 18 years old. And they won a championship with Giannis. Uh, Milwaukee, first time winning the championship since 1971, 50 years. But the Lakers were ahead of the curve. And they had just a, 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 a wealth of riches of young talent, the deepest young talent in the league at the time. There's no, there's no question about that. Anyone can research and and, and, and they, they'll come across articles and what whatnot uh, stating the fact. And, you know, along with Josh Hart, 
you drafted a Kyle Kuzma who's really, when you look at his uh, mentality and makeup as a player, he's really a six man with a superstar mentality because his number was called to hit, you know, uh, in game winning situations, to hit the big shot. And his first two years after being traded to the Washington Wizards, he had 10 game winning shots for that franchise. He was so much of an emphasis that his star player, who was the uh, uh, face of the franchise for the previous four or five years, Bradley Beal, he deferred to Kuzma and was looking for him to hit the big shot because they knew he could hit it. So I'd never seen a six man with a superstar mentality where his numbers called to hit a big shot at the end of the game. I never we've seen a whole bunch of great six men who were great scorers or great defenders, but they didn't necessarily close our games. Like Jamal Crawford. Jamal Crawford didn't close our game. He'll come in, get you eight, he get you about 20 a game. You know, he wanted he wanted the greatest six men of all time. But he wasn't asked to hit that big shot though. No, no. Kyle Kuzma was. And then Jordan Clarkson. Jordan Clarkson was like a six-man version of Kobe Bryant. The, the mentality to come in, he's going to shoot. He's going to put constant pressure on that defense to uh, challenge him. And, you know, eventually, you know, he's, he's going to score in waves, you know. And uh, he's the only original Laker to win six-man of the year. Now, uh, Lamar Odom, who played for the Lakers, you know, uh, from uh from you know uh from that Shaquille O'Neal trade up until like 2011 he played for like was 7 years and he won the six man of the year in 2011 but he was not a, a draftee he was not an original drafted player you know uh Michael Cooper lifelong laker he was uh awarded defensive player of the year in 1987 but he never won six man of the year but Jordan Clarkson holds that distinction you know, uh, with the Utah Jazz and doing so. And, and I, I could just sit here and imagine the second unit we would have. We would clearly have had the best second unit. Actually, we was already a top-ranked second unit the year before all this started, you know, going win-now mode. We had one of the top second units in basketball already with young players. And this was after they traded Lou Williams to the Houston Rockets uh, to get that number two pick, which they used to draft Lonzo Ball. They're, they already had a top second unit in, in the league. So imagine what they could have turned into if they had been allowed to grow together and develop. It would have been second to none. It, it wouldn't have been no drop-off. It practically would not have been no drop-off, you know. But Josh Hart, I remember when he was drafted, uh, Scott report on him, intangibles, coming off a national championship. We, we was drafting players who was winning national titles. A Mo Wagner, who's playing great with the Orlando Magic, he he as a uh, at large bid team, at large at large uh, bid team, he led the Michigan Wolverines to the national title game as an underdog throughout the tournament. So we was man, we were drafting young men with high character and pedigree, and we gave that all up. It, it, it's stunning to me. It's stunning to me. But nonetheless. Scott report on Josh Hart, great elite rebounder. And that has carried over throughout his entire NBA career. Um, he's the best pound for pound rebounder in the NBA. And the Los Angeles Lakers drafted that type of player. Pound for pound, he's the best rebounder in the NBA. He tough, he gritty, he got the intangible don't, don't always show up in, in the stat sheet, but he contributes to winning. And to justify, you know, letting all that young talent go. And disperse them throughout the NBA because most of them had to reestablish their careers with teams who had been struggling before they got there. So the notion to say, well, they're they not winners, that's a misnomer. That's not that's not even looking at it uh, uh, logically, realistically, you know, because uh, they were so young when they were let go. It wasn't like they was 24, 25. They was 21, 20, 21 years old on average, they were being let go. So, um, Josh Hart, he has the intangibles, and he contributed to the Knicks, New York Knicks victory tonight uh, at home 
overcoming a 19 point deficit versus a very good Sacramento, well, a good Sacramento Kings team who had kind of been on the roll and beat them by the score of 120 to 109. Josh Hart tallied 31 points, I believe nine rebounds. It's either nine rebounds or 11 rebounds and eight assists. And his ability to drive to the basket full court, he had, he has darn perfected that. You know, uh, he he's developed that Euro step, but it's it's not like a wide Euro step. It's more like a where he gets like just that small space of separation to uh, you know uh, pass by the defender to finish at the uh, at at the rim. And uh, you know, like I said, as a Laker fan, as a lifelong fan of this uh, franchise, my support for them is no different than how I supported. Uh, Showtime Lakers or the Lakers who were drafted post Showtime during the uh, uh, early and mid 90s from Eddie Jones to Nick Van Exel. Uh, I carry the same excitement, you know, uh, and then, of course, when we uh, brought in 18 uh, year old Kobe Bean Bryant, Derek Fisher, nothing has changed, man. It's been the same. But, you know, the opportunity to watch these young players grow together, man, that was taken away. So therefore, my way of trying to adapt to that is to support them as if they still play for the purple and gold. Because when I watch them play, I see them wearing the Laker jersey. Because the only reason they were let go, it, it, it was not a performance issue. It had nothing to do with performance. It's because when they brought that dude to the team, he wanted them gone to flip around along with the multitude of draft picks to uh, bring in superstars and then stack the deck with veteran-laden players who had, like, a, uh, uh, you know, higher hands, you know, coming in real quick, trying to win a quick ring. And uh, that formula, man, it's not, it's not exciting to me, man. It's not, it's not real team building. It's nothing really competitive about that. And it's nothing fulfilling. You know, when you watch Kobe Bryant start off as an 18-year-old and he goes through the struggles of, uh, of, uh, you know, uh, growing as a player. And then once he ascended and when him and Shaquille O'Neal won that first championship, man, you had such a, just a, 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 a wonderful feeling, man. Cause you're like, man, this is, this is our guy who we like, you know, uh, help uh, grow and nurture over four years, man, from a young man to a full fledged adult basketball player. And, and it just, man, you, you just get chills thinking about it. And, and had that taken away, you know, uh, to me, it's not pleasant, man. It's not pleasant. You see all these other teams out here, you know, they reaping the rewards of sticking with their young players. Denver Nuggets, uh, even when Jamal Murray got hurt, injured his uh, knee, they stayed the course with him. Michael Porter had the back injuries. They stayed the course with him. And, 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 and they say patience is virtue. Patience is virtue. Uh, like I said, we, we already had a top rank second unit in basketball starting out. So we would clearly have the, the, the best second unit in, 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 in the NBA bar none, you know, and you continue drafting in young talent, prototype players and fit your system. It would have, it would have been like the San Antonio Spurs rolling for 20 some years playing at where you always a contender. You always in the conversation to win, man. And, and, uh, the, the, the role that the Lakers have been forced to take, you know, I, I just don't, I don't find no gratification in it, man. I just when it stop when it stops being real, then uh, uh, it becomes distant to me. You know, it's almost like a numb feeling. And uh, you know, uh, I know we had the best young core in the league. There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. If you look at where, you know, where, where everybody's doing, they would be doing better playing for the Lakers than where they are right now. You know, Brandon Ingram lost a year of development because. He, uh, he was in the process of getting traded, so he couldn't develop. If he had been allowed to develop with, without the, without the uh, chaos, his third year he would have averaged twenty two a game. He doubled his scoring from his rookie year, eight points a game, to sixteen in his uh, second year, and uh, he started to put on weight, started to get a little strong, started to develop that mid range shot, and he, he he just started to improve. He would average twenty two a game. You know, Julius Randle, first player since Larry Bird to average 24, 10, and 6 while shooting 80% from the free throw line and 40% from three in the same year. Abisa Zubak, if he was 
he's a traditional back to the basket uh prototype center and to get him going man you got to feed him the ball and he's been he has been underutilized with the Clippers because he was already undervalued when he was traded there. He was already undervalued, but if you'd allow to grow and develop, you're talking about another Marcus Saul with more offensive touch around the basket. So you're talking about someone who, who would definitely have been averaging 18 to 20 a game. Thomas Bryant, when they brought him back last year for the, for, the, for once, well, half a season anyway, when he was inserted to the star lineup, I knew what he was going to do. I see he's going to average about 16 and 9. He averaged 17. He actually averaged about 17 and 9. It didn't surprise me. And he gave 150% effort because he always, he always played hard and give, and give you 150%. So I'm just proud of all of them, man, because they was faced with adversity. They had no business having to be challenged with. And they had to, they, they really had no support. See, all these other young players, like, you look at the young player for the Denver Nuggets. You look at Christian Braun. He got a great support system, man. He can develop at his own rate. Uh, he contributed. He contributed to their championship last year in the final versus uh, Miami. He had, he had some very uh, uh, vital uh, performances to so, to solidify the lead for Denver uh, going up three one before they closed it closed it at home and won their first championship in franchise history. He was a rookie, you know. And and and, it, and and he he was like developed man he was he was nurtured as a young player same thing with Oklahoma City doing the same thing down there what what they doing in Minnesota for uh, Anthony Edwards and uh, Jaden McDaniels and Nas Reed you know what I'm saying it works that's what I'm trying to say Houston Rockets have improved you know they was they was the highest team in the league for a minute there but ultimately they missing they center uh, Alperin Sangoon who suffered that uh, knee injury. And he may be gone for the season, but Lando Magic, look, look, Lando Magic is a playoff level team. You got to stick with your young talent. If that's the case, why you draft him? If you go, if you know you're gonna let him go, why you draft him for? So the practice of flipping over young talent to bring in superstars that that that's passe. And actually, and fundamentally, it's dysfunctional. It's dysfunctional to. Ship out your young talent who you spent countless hours drafting and, and scouting to draft, and you you use them as assets to flip over, and you think you're gonna stack the deck and, and run the table, but you don't, because the other teams have figured figured out how to counter that by sticking with their young talent, developing them, and now they're reaping the benefits, and really you got a situation where the the only way. The teams that ain't win out mode can compete with these young teams that have built up. They got to try to stack the deck. So what you're saying is you can't beat them otherwise. That's what that, that's what that it is saying. So when Jokic broke through last year and won a championship, he could sit there and say, I did it the right way by the book. And I I, I, I led the team with my, my, my uh, second and third best player were down and and as a result, that solidified, that fortified his uh, determination and leading that team to a championship last year, beating uh, uh, Kevin Durant and Devin Booker, beating uh, uh, LeBron James and Anthony Davis. You see what I'm saying? So kudos to Josh Hart. He contributed to that win last night. He is a winner. He brings intangibles. And uh, uh, New York, man, uh, they better off by acquiring him, you know, 31 points, 9 rebounds, 8 assists, and play good defense, too. So, to me, all them young men, no matter what is said, they are the real Los Angeles Lakers. Everybody knows it. Even the people who supported letting them go and having them traded off deep down in their heart, they know they're the real Lakers. Period. Because they were drafted to be the future and the cornerstone of this franchise. So I will always see them as such, always root for them. And they win us to me just by having the character to, to uh, show enough belief in themselves that they can establish uh, a uh, um, uh, very uh, a worthy career for themselves and say, you know what, despite what went down, hey, I know that I belong. And that's, where, that's what it comes down to. So I just want to share that real quick. 
Until next time, this is JB for BTB Behind the Bench.